Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Inches Church this morning. It's a lovely, uh, crisp, early winter morning, and good to have you all here with us today um, as we worship God and um, hear of his word. Um, we uh, particularly welcome any visitors or people here for the first time. As usual, we have tea and coffee served after the service uh, in the gathering hall out here um, and a trolley here. So um, please feel free to come and join us, get to know us a bit better. We'd love to have a chat with you. A couple of things just to draw your attention to. Um, firstly, uh, just for those who don't know that Ushi Macbeth's funeral has been postponed um, and details of when it's going to be will follow in due course. And also we're um, for our community Christmas carol, we have uh, flyers, leaflets to be uh, handed out. So if you'd like to um, uh, deliver some of these, we're needing people to, to do that task. So um, they're, they're out in the gathering hall and if you speak to Doris, she'll keep you right in that. So um, that's my welcome and uh, hand over to David. Gavin, morning to everyone. Um, yeah, I would just add uh, one thing to that. The next Sunday afternoon, we have this service for remembering, which is uh, particularly for those who may have lost a loved one, uh, maybe in the last year, but maybe uh, just beyond that, uh, it's open to anyone who would like to take the opportunity just to reflect and to remember uh, on someone they have lost. So that's next Sunday afternoon at three o'clock. Anyway, um, in uh, one of the Psalms, at the end of Psalm 106, um, we hear this, Save us, O Lord, our God, gather us from the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. And there's a sense in which that's what God has done. He's saved us. He's gathered us this morning. There's a lot of different nations represented here today. He's gathered us that we may give thanks to Him and glory in His praise. So let's do that. We're going to begin by singing with the help of the band, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, a great hymn, an old hymn. Um, yeah, I was going to say that is the hymn, not that previous one. <laughs> A great hymn from the past. Let's stand and sing these words together.
Well, let's come uh, to God in prayer. Let's all pray together. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, You are this holy, this unique God that we have been singing about without peer, without rival, no one remotely like You, nor could there ever be. Yet we recognize that however far we grow in our understanding, we'll never be able to plumb the depths of either Your greatness or Your goodness your might or your mercy, your love or your grace. Lord, you are infinite in all your perfections. And even to say that, Father, is to say something that we cannot fully grasp. And yet how we praise you and thank you that all these perfections were contained within the person of your Son, Jesus of Nazareth, that the fullness of God dwelt and still dwells in Him in bodily form. Thank You that we see Your greatness, Your goodness, Your might, Your mercy, Your love, Your grace perfectly revealed and expressed in Him here in this world, in His birth, His life, His ministry, his death for our sins on the cross, His resurrection from the grave, His ascension to Your right hand. Thank You, Father, for all of that. And thank You as we come to You through Jesus on the basis of all He has done for us. And as we confess our sins and shortcomings, thank You that we may know through faith the reality of all that You are for us in Christ, the reality of forgiveness by His death, the reality of renewal by Your Holy Spirit. We pray that we may know these realities in fuller, deeper measure. And with that in mind, Lord, as we come in a moment to read from the Bible, it seems so often when Your Word seeks access to the castle of our mind and hearts, it meets with the resistant guards of skepticism or unbelief or indifference. Lord, we seem to be able to find so many reasons for not taking Your Word seriously, for not hearing it. But we would pray that by the power and the presence of Your Holy Spirit, that Your Word would find entrance and lodging in our hearts and minds, and that it might bring humility before Yourself, a turning towards You in faith, a joy in You, as well as a renewed love and concern for our neighbors and a zeal for Your kingdom. Hear our prayer and hear us further as again we rejoice to be able to pray together our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we're continuing um, to follow the, the story of Abraham in, in the Old Testament, in the first book of the Bible, in Genesis. Uh, we've been reading it through, and we came last week to chapter 18. Chapter 18 and 19, actually, uh, sometimes these chapters cover vast tracts, many years, uh, lots of gaps between them. Chapters 18 and 19 basically cover a 24-hour period in Abraham's life. And it's a kind of crucial period, coming near to the fulfillment of the promise of Isaac. But before that also, this e episode relating to Sodom and to Gomorrah. And we're going to read that episode now in, in Genesis 19, but I want just to remind you of the background to it from a couple of verses in chapter 18. This is why this is happening. Um, this is the Lord with Abraham 
and saying of him in chapter 18, then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abram what I'm about to do? He means in relation to Sodom. Abram will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I've chosen him so that he'll direct his children, his household after him, to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. And then the Lord says, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, their sin so grievous, that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. And then, you know, that provokes Abraham to pray to the Lord. He's concerned that somehow when the Lord sw- brings judgment on Sodom, he's going to sweep away the righteous with the wicked. And so he prays, and we've got that question, that concern that is summed up in that question we looked at last week in verse 25 of 18, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord reassures Abram that he will do what is right. So, that's the background to what we're about to read here. So, this is Genesis 19 and verse 1. The two angels, two of the three who had been with Abraham, the Lord had been there with the two angels, but the two angels, the Lord stayed with Abraham. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. And when he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But Lot insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. And he prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house, and they called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who've never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them, but don't do anything to these men, for they've come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. And they said, this fellow, Lot, came here as an alien, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so that they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here, because we're going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. Amen. Now, we'll read the rest of that um, a little later. But boys and girls, I wanted just to speak just for a moment with you. This This is not a good story in Genesis 19. There's a lot of bad things happening there, bad things, the details of which we don't need to go into this morning. But it's there. It's there in the Bible. There were bad things going on. And actually, you know, when you read something like that, you have to remember that when you look out in the world, when you look out in the world, when I look out in the world, I see there are still bad things going on in the world. Is that all right? Sometimes, sometimes we don't see them. Sometimes we do see them. And it struck me this morning, I just wanted to say this to you, that there are two things you need to remember whenever you see bad things going on in the world. And the two things are this. The first is that God has promised that He will put things right one day, that He'll deal with the bad things. And it's important that we know that. He will deal with the bad things. 
And then the second thing is to remember, it's important to remember that it's not just that we see bad things out there. It's we can see bad things going on sometimes in our own hearts and minds and lives, can't we, sometimes? Things, bad things that we think, bad things that we do, bad things. And it's important that when we see bad, whether it's out there or in here, it brings us to Jesus, because that's why God sent Jesus into the world to deal with bad things, to bring forgiveness to those who will receive him, and one day to put them right. And that's the thing, I think that's the thing I would most want you to say and to remember. Whenever you see bad things out there, whenever you see bad things in here, in your own life, in your own heart, in your own life, then let them bring you to Jesus, because that's why he came. And that's why he'll come again one day to put those bad things right. And he's the only one that can put us right with God too. Okay, that's just something I hope for you to think about. We've got to think about this story together as well. It's a serious story. It's an important story. And it's one I hope that will drive us to God, to Jesus. Anyway, we're going to sing, before you go off uh, to Truth Tracker, we're going to sing um, a song which just reminds us what God has done for us in Jesus. Holy God in love became perfect man to bear my blame. We'll just remain seated to sing this through a couple of times. And then um, Alan will come and lead us in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you this morning in awe of your majesty. We acknowledge you as our King and our God. We rejoice that we come before you, not in any merit of what we've done, but solely in reliance on your love for us. We thank you for that undeserved love, for the death and resurrection of Jesus to open the way for us to have a living relationship with you. We bring our thoughts and prayers, depending on that unshakable love before you now, for our world and for others. We lift up this morning the land of Ukraine in its terrible war situation with Russia. We are shocked to see the physical devastation of buildings razed to the ground 
of silent power plants and of the human cost. Lord, we come to you pleading for your intervention in this war, that the fighting would cease. We remember those killed in the fighting, both soldiers and civilians. We pray for broken families, for children without parents, for the lost one's love, for the broken communities. Lord, be with them and heal their pain. We hold up to you too, the politicians and military advisors on both sides, that they would see the futility of this war and that they would be swayed to a more peaceful course of action for the sake of all your people. We pray too for the Christians in Ukraine, that they would remain strong in their faith, that they would be light in that dark situation, showing your love and help to those in greatest need. We remember the refugees fleeing from that land, seeking safety in other countries. We ask for safety as they travel for the provision of a safe place to stay, for open homes and hearts of those who would help them. Be their shield as they flee that war. Around the world, we see so many issues of war, of famine, of disease, of abject poverty, of starvation and drought. Lord, help us steward your creation better. As COP27 has now finished, we pray that the actions agreed would be delivered on. Guide the politicians in making these de declarations tangible in their individual countries, that these principles and obligations are not swept under the carpet for more seemingly immediate issues. And Lord, forgive us for the damage we've done to your created world for our disregard for the impact our actions have had and continue to have on people and places around the world. In our world, Open Doors estimates that 360 million Christians are suffering persecution or discrimination. Lord, we pray for those followers who are suffering for their faith. We ask that you would give them confidence in your sufficiency in your love for them and in their ultimate security in you. Practically, Lord, we ask for their safety, the ha that the hands that would be raised against them are restrained. Be with those in prison or labor camps because they have followed you. Give them confidence in what they believe, that you are with them through the ordeals they are facing. Be with those cut off from their families and shunned by their societies. Grant them knowledge of your love and the fellowship of other believers praying for them. We pray for our health services as the systems are groaning under the pressure of great need. We, give, we ask for perseverance for those working in our hospitals, care homes and GP surgeries to keep giving of their best to help those sick folk. We pray for all the different services provided, surgical, me medical, dental, mental health, old age, ambulances, for the catering, portering and cleaning. Lord, the list is vast, but we thank you for the dedication of all the folk it takes to keep things going. Nearer our congregation, we pray for the upcoming union of inches in the East. We ask for wisdom, and the many practical decisions that have to be made. Be with us as we seek to build one united congregation focused on you and the word of God. Help us all in the changes that will be needed, that we would be open and accepting of these changes, of the new fellowships to build, of the new structures and constitution, of the new ways of doing things, and in the unexpected things too. As we face these challenges, we pray for all the other congregations in our presbytery and across Scotland, facing the same reality of the need for change, to move on from what's been and to face a new way forward, trusting always, God, that you are journeying with us. For our outreach in Milton of Lays, 
we pray for you to change hearts, to incline folk to come and hear the gospel message. We remember the carol gathering at the start of December, asking that as the invitations go out over the coming days, dropping through the letter boxes, folk would pause and read them, that the hearts you are working in might be stirred up to find out more. As we move this outreach forward, we ask that you would be preparing someone to come and lead it. Someone with a heart for you and for reaching out to folk who don't yet know you. We ask that you, Lord, are with us in this process of discerning your person for that role. Father God, we remember before you now those who are sick, at home, in hospital, or in a care setting. We pray for healing, for the respite from pain, where that lies within your plan and will. We think of those waiting for tests, anxious for results, dreading procedures, uncertain of outcomes. Lord, give them patience to endure what they're facing. Give us caring hearts to uphold them in our prayers. As we now name them before you, quietly, those we're remembering. Lord, there seems to have been so many deaths in our congregation recently, we cannot but pray for the grieving families. Lord, in these families, be with husbands and wives, with children, with aunts and uncles, with grands and grandparents, with friends and colleagues, with all who grieve for the loss of a loved one. Grant them your ultimate peace and comfort. Send your Holy Spirit to be with them, in the busyness of arrangements, in the quiet of the night, and in the mist touch or voice. Please, God, heed these our prayers for others. And now, as David brings God's message to us, grant to him clarity of thought under your guidance, and grant to us receptive hearts to hear, consider, and respond to what that preaching is from God's word. And we ask all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to sing again before we read uh, the rest of Genesis 19. The grace of God has reached for me, pulled me from the raging sea.
I want to read the, the rest, or not quite the whole of the rest of the chapter, but the rest of the story as it concerns Sodom, from verse 14. So, Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were pledged to marry his daughters, and he said, hurry and get out of this place, because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you'll be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. And as soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. But the Lot said to them, No, my lords, please, your servant has found favor in your eyes and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. This disaster will overtake me and I'll die. Look, here is a town near enough to run to, and it's small. Let me flee to it. It's very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. And he said to him, very well, I will grant this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of, but flee there quickly, because I cannot do anything until you reach it. That's why the town was called Zoar. By the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. And thus he overthrew through those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And early the next morning, Abram got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah, towards all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. And so when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where, the Lot, where Lot had lived. Amen. And may God bless to us the reading of his word. Now, I don't know what your reaction uh, to Genesis 19 is. It's not an easy story to read. It's not an easy story to preach on which is, of course, not a reason for avoiding it. Among other things, I guess one of the reasons why we perhaps may be a bit uncomfortable with it is because it raises the whole subject of uh, God's judgment. And again, that is a subject with which we can often be uncomfortable talking about. Although I have to say that the Bible itself knows no such inhibitions. It's unashamed about talking about God's judgment, recording it, not because in any sense it relishes it, but rather because it regards and reveals the judgment of God as being an essential part of God's righteous character. It's actually something good and necessary. And that's really why I wanted to read that bit uh, before we read chapter 19. I want to remind you of the bit that leads into it in chapter 18, where this, it's evident, isn't it, that here is God revealing His character, His person, His purposes in, about, in what He's about to do and revealing it deliberately to Abraham, not hiding it from him. Why doesn't he want to hide it from Abram? Well, he tells us, because Abram's going to become a great, powerful nation. All the nations on earth will be blessed through him. I've chosen him, so he will direct his children, his household, after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Hear that? Abram is to be an instrument of blessing to all nations, to succeeding generations, so he's got to be able to recognize and embrace and practice 
righteousness and justice. And so then Abraham hears the Lord saying, verse 20 and 18, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, their sin so grievous, I'll go down and see if what they've done is as bad as the outcry that's reached me. Here's God, as it were, committing himself to investigating the situation in Sodom to see if things are as bad as that, i.e., if it merits judgment. And of course, it's hearing that which provokes Abraham then to express his prayer, his concern, uh, that somehow in judging Sodom, God might act unjustly, that he might sweep away the righteous with the wicked. And of course, that concern, as I mentioned before, the reading is summed up in that question, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And Abraham pours that out to God, and God gives him the necessary reassurance. And all of these different elements are meant to indicate to us that the judgment of God is always and only about righteousness and justice. And as I hope we'll also see alongside it, there is mercy too, or the offer of mercy. But I think it's particularly at the beginning here, I think we need to think a little bit about judgment because often that's what we struggle to accept, perhaps especially in our own particular day. And yet it's in a world, isn't it, in which we're aware, I think we can't be unaware that there is, that evil is a reality. And in that world, actually, however, str- however much we may struggle to accept the notion of judgment, there is something within us that longs for it. That's what I mean by that. Well, I think I saw an example of this the other day. The other uh, morning, I caught the tail end of Nicky Campbell's uh, call, uh, your call, his phone in, uh, uh, just on Radio 5 Live. I, I was just, uh, I was gone to make myself a coffee. I turned on the radio. It was the last five minutes of the program. And it was a discussion on sexual abuse. And it wasn't a general discussion. It was actually a very specific discussion. You may know Nicky Campbell. I I don't know if you know his situation. But he's recently spoken out publicly of some of the abuse he suffered and particularly the sexual abuse that he witnessed uh, his friends receiving when he was at school in Edinburgh as a primary says, so This is a boy in Edinburgh. He witnessed sexual abuse at the hands of one particular teacher. And he's spoken at some length of the ongoing impact of that upon himself and upon his friends. And then in that context also, he's spoken more recently of the shock of discovering that the perpetrator of all that is alive and is in South Africa. And all of the folk involved in this discussion, there was just three or four of them, I think, um, were, were involved in one way or another. And they spoke about seeking to get the extradition of this man to Scotland they called him Edgar. That's not his name. That's the name they have to, he's got to have some anonymity. They talk about getting the extradition of this man to Scotland to stand trial. And it's not clear that that's going to happen. And so they talked about, and you could imagine, this was pretty painful stuff. This was poignant stuff, um, emotional stuff. And just at the end of it, heading for the 11 o'clock news, Nicky Campbell finished by saying, in relation to Edgar. He said, I want to say this, in those stinging but elegant words of Christopher Hitchin, I only wish there was a hell for him to go to. That's what he said. In those stinging but elegant words of Christopher Hitchin, I only wish there was a hell for him to go to. What's he wanting? He's wanting judgment, isn't he? He fears that this man will never answer for his crimes, his sins. He fears 
that there will never be justice in this life. And just in those words quoted by Christopher Hitchin, who was, of course, an atheist, he's longing for that justice. But there's the problem. It, he doesn't, I'm not quite sure, I think Nicky Campbell, I don't know if Nicky Campbell would call himself an atheist. I think he's certainly agnostic. Christopher Hitchin certainly was an atheist. Doesn't believe in God, doesn't believe in hell. And all he can say, therefore, is, I only wish. But you see, that longing for justice, it raises a problem. It raises a particular problem, actually, for the atheist. Because if there is no God, if our world and we ourselves as human beings are just a cosmic accident, why do we long for justice? Why do we expect there to be justice in their world? Why do we think there ought to be justice in the world? That makes absolutely no sense. If life is random, if we're an accident, where does that longing come from? It's the Bible that makes sense of that longing. It's a memory trace of people being made in the image of God. The book of Genesis tells us that neither we nor our world is an accident. There is a God, a good God, who in the beginning made a world and a humanity that was good, very good, if you read the opening chapters of Genesis, made us in his own image. And that God is himself right and just. And indeed, he defines what is right and just. He defines what is right and wrong. And who in that rightness will deal with what goes wrong. And you can see that if you read the story, the sad story of Genesis 3 onwards as it unfolds. Remember what happened in the garden. God had warned in the garden that if we human beings decided that we could do life without him, act as if we were self-made rather than God-made, if we chose wrong over right, he had warned that the righteous judgment of God would come. But Adam and Eve believed the deceptive lie of the serpent. Remember, the serpent said, there'll be no judgment. You will not surely die. They believed it, disobeyed, but death did come. Spiritual death, physical death. God brought that righteous judgment. He also, of course, promised mercy in a Savior, from the seed of the woman who would come and put things right, but judgment came. And if you read through the early chapters of Genesis, you'll see it comes again. It came again in Genesis 6 when we're told the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time, and judgment came in the form of, of the, the flood that swept everyone away. But with that judgment, there was also mercy, wasn't there, in the rescue of Noah and his family and everything within the ark. And now we come to Sodom and Gomorrah, and we see these themes returning again of judgment and mercy. Judgment and mercy. Not the one without the other, but both are there. And in relation to the judgment, I think what we need to see, what we're meant to see, is both the reality and the rightness of it. Again, why is it to fall? Why is God's judgment to fall 
upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, it's, it's human wickedness, isn't it? 18 and 18, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great. Their sin is so grievous. And that statement is not a surprise, actually. Again, if you've read the previous chapters, remember when Lot chose um, in chapter 13 to pitch his tents near Sodom, we were told at that point, now the men of Sodom were wicked, were sinning greatly against the Lord. And then in chapter 14, there was the surly, the, un, the surly and ungrateful attitude of the king of Sodom when Abram came back with Lot and all that had been stolen by, the Kedor, by Kedor Laomer and, and co. But again, just because we, it's important that we see the justice of this, again, notice that in 19, that before any judgment falls, God does, in effect, check through these two angels that things are as bad as the outcry. So, as they come to Sodom, what do they find? Well, sadly, they find the outcry is justified. Again, look at what happens. Lot affords these two strangers hospitality. It's night, so he offers them a bed, and when they initially refuse and say they'll spend the night in the square, he strongly insists, Lot strongly insists, no, they spend the night in his house, which surely implies that Lot knows it's not safe for them to spend the night in the square. And that's confirmed, isn't it, by what happens next. Lot's house is surrounded by four, verse four there, 19, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. Again, those alls and every, it's just indicating this is not a small minority. This is the whole town, as it were. And what do they want? Well, it's hard to say, isn't it? Well, it is. It's easy to say. It's hard to say the words. What they want is homosexual gang rape. I mean, basically, essentially, that's what's been spoken of here. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can, well, literally, the Hebrew word is know them. But the NIV, I think, is right to translate it, have sex with them, because that Hebrew word is regularly used to mean to have sexual intercourse, which is why the NIV translates as it does. And that that is the right translation is, I think, borne out by this then horrific offer that Lot makes to try and placate the crowd. No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never, and again, the word is known a man. It's clear. That means has never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. Now, that's, that is a horrific offer, is it not? But it does indicate, I think, that what Lot believes the crowd were after. Whichever way you look at it, this is, it is horrific, homosexual gang rape. Now, I think, again, it's important to say at this point, this is not the only sin uh, for which the people of Sodom were guilty of at this time. If you read the rest of the Bible, it's not the only reason why judgment fell. Ezekiel 16, 49 talks about Sodom and speaks of they had pride, excess of food, prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and the needy. So, there were other things going on as well. But we have to say that here in Genesis 19, it's this particular sexual sin that is highlighted. So, I think it's important at least to say something about it. And I want just to do that by placing it in the bigger biblical picture. And I think this is what I want to say. I want to stress that from the beginning to the end of the Bible, it is consistent and clear that sex sexual intimacy, was intended by God to take place only 
within the context of public, lifelong, committed relationship between a man and a woman, i.e., in the context of heterosexual marriage. That's where God placed sex to be expressed. And that means that all sexual activity or stimulation, heterosexual or homosexual, outside of that, marriage between a man and a woman, all sexual activity, intimacy, whether actual, verbal, visual, or even virtual, is wrong. That's the Bible's position. That's Jesus' position. And if you and I take that seriously, then in the words of Proverbs 20, 29, 20 and 9, who can say, I have kept my heart pure? I am clean and without sin. I know I can't. All of us, in some manner, will have fallen short, but that is not a reason to try to lower the standard that the Bible sets, that Jesus sets. That is not a reason to lower the bar. It's important, and I know this is not popular, but it's important that we're clear on that standard. That's the Bible standard, faithfulness in marriage if you're married, abstinence outside of it. It's important that we're clear on that, but it's equally clear, and I need to say this as well, it's equally clear that we're, that it's an equally important rather that we're clear on the the mercy, the grace that is offered to us by God in Jesus wherever we have failed to meet that standard and admit it. And in that regard, you have to remember, I want you to remember, I want to say this to you, I want to remind you of the way that Jesus dealt with a woman caught in adultery. When she was brought to Him by a self-righteous crowd baying for her blood, now, remember, she never at any point, if you read that story in John 8, she never at any point seeks to excuse herself. She never at any point seeks to justify herself. But you remember what Jesus said to the crowds, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And, of course, that silenced them. And they silently crept away, slowly crept away. And then he said to her, remember what he said to her, woman, has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, sir. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. He offers her forgiveness but with it a call to turn, to repent, to turn away from her previous life. And Jesus was offering and does offer grace for both of those, the forgiveness and the repentance. Indeed, He died to secure that for all who will admit and then trust and follow Him. So, wherever we have failed in the realm, whether in, as heterosexual or homosexual, there is mercy available from God in Christ. But it's important, vital, in fact, that we receive it. You must receive it. And that actually takes us back to Sodom because having thought a little about it, but the judgment, we need to think about the mercy. Because these two angels coming down into Sodom, they're messengers of judgment, yes, but they're also messengers of mercy. They're offering a rescue. They're offering an escape from judgment. 
even actually, I don't know if you realize this, but even to that angry and lustful crowd. I mean, when Lot went out to plead with them, verse 7, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Was that not an opportunity for them to think again, to turn away from the course in which they're set? But of course, no, they're determined. Get out of our way, they replied. And then they express self-righteous anger with Lot. Don't they? This fellow, Lot, he came here as an alien. Now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. You know what they're saying. They're saying, who does he think he is telling us how to live our lives? And I guess that can be the reaction these days for many when they hear somebody setting out the Bible teaching on sexual relationships. Who are you to tell us how to live our lives? And that's absolutely true. I have absolutely no right to tell you how to live your life. But does not the God who made the world, who made each one of us, sustains us in life, who made us male and female, who gave the gift of sex, does He not have the right back to the crowd. When they try to grab Lot, the angels pull him in, don't they? Strike the crowd with blindness, so they're all left groping around, unable to find the door. Wasn't that another opportunity to think again, to turn away? But again, they're determined. They refuse the mercy. They refuse the rescue. And then there's Lot's son-in-laws, part of the community in Sodom. There's mercy. There's an offer of rescue offered to them with the encouragement of the angels. Lot goes to them, pleads with them, hurry, get out of this place because the Lord's about to destroy the city. But they laugh. They think that any talk of judgment is a joke. And I suspect that may well be representative of many today as well. They just don't take God, His Word, His righteousness seriously. And so again, the mercy, the rescues refused. And you read on, and even Lot himself, he doesn't laugh, but he lingers. Verse 16 says, he hesitated. It's as if he's torn, isn't it, Lot? He doesn't, Lot does not come out of this story well, I'm afraid. A believer though he is, he's clearly become too comfortable in this godless society. Maybe he too is just struggling to come to terms with the reality of God's judgment, just to take it seriously. And so, he, he lingers, he hesitates. And again, this is where you do see the mercy of God. When we read, when he hesitated, the men just grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. But again, you see, you need to receive that mercy. And sadly, there's another twist to the tale here as they're hurried out of the city towards safety. They're warned, flee from your lives. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere. Flee to the mountains or you'll be swept away. And again, you see hesitation on Lot's part. You seem to see compromise, having acknowledged he's received mercy. He asked to be able to go to a smaller place nearby. And again, in mercy, he's granted that. And just then, when you think everyone is safe, you're told in verse 26, but Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. She'd started to leave physically, having been grabbed, but she clearly had never left Sodom in her heart. She looked back indicating that she wanted to go back. And certainly that's the way that Jesus understood that. 
For when in Luke 17 He's calling people to look for, to live for the kingdom of God that He's come to bring, that He will bring, He holds up Lot's wife as a warning. Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's wife. And then immediately He says, whoever tries to keep his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. Again, what's this all about? You know, there's a famous scene in the film Titanic when the ship has hit the iceberg, but only a few on board realize what's happening or what's about to happen. Nobody else seems to know, and Rose, the heroine, she comes to Mr. Andrews, who's the designer of the boat, the ship, who does know and is kind of wandering around the ship in a daze. And Rose comes to him, and she says to him, Mr. Andrews, I saw the iceberg. I see it in your eyes. Tell me the truth. And he says to her, the ship will sink in an hour. All this will be at the bottom of the Atlantic. And then he says, remember what I told you about the lifeboats. Go to a boat quickly. Don't wait. What is that? That's just somebody issuing a true, urgent, loving warning. And that's really what Genesis 19 is. That really is what it is. It's a true, urgent, loving warning, which is actually echoed throughout the Bible as a whole, that the righteous judgment of God will come against all godlessness and wickedness, all human sin. It will come. Paul expresses it in in Acts 17. God has set a day when He'll judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed. He's given proof of this by raising Him from the dead. He's just saying that that day's coming. It is coming. Be ready. And that is the essential message of Genesis 19. That's the way Jesus used this story. Again, Luke 17, it was the same. Jesus said it was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building. But the day Lot left, Sodom, fire, and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this, says Jesus, on the day the Son of Man is revealed. He's just pleading with us. Be ready. Be ready. And what does that mean? It means recognize God's mercy and receive the rescue. Get to the lifeboat. The only lifeboat there is, and that, of course, is Jesus Himself, the Son of God, the one who in his death bore the judgment of God upon human sin for all those who will trust him, so that trusting him, you will never have to face that judgment. That's how to be ready. It's the only way to be ready. In mercy, he's provided the rescue in Jesus don't laugh. Don't linger. Don't look back. Just receive Him. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, give us grace, we pray, to hear Your Word, and not, we pray, just to be hearers, but doers also. 
we thank you, Lord Jesus, that, well, when you saw the judgment of God coming upon Jerusalem, you wept at the prospect. And indeed, you gave your life, your very life, your perfect life up so that all who trust you would never have to face that judgment. So we pray that that may be true of us this day, that if we've never run to you, we would run to you. If we've never rested on you, we would rest in you. And Lord, we pray also that you would give us grace if we have trusted you to rely upon you completely and certainly never to look back. Hear us, help us, Lord, in these things. Hear the cries of our hearts, we ask in your name and for your sake. Amen. Well, we're going to sing these words, which are really just a prayer. Um, o oh great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart. We say the grace uh, to one another, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. My humble offering 